Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second installment of our Global Perspective Speaker Series for 2021. My name is Mark Wynn. I'm a Vice President in the International Group here at the Dallas Fed and Director of the Bank's Globalization Institute, which hosts these events in collaboration with our Communications and Outreach Department. Our guest this evening is Mike Rawlings, who serves as the 61st Mayor of Dallas and was also the longest serving mayor in more than 57 years. Elected for his second and final four-year term in 2015, he served as mayor until June 2019. While in office, he focused on spurring economic development in the southern portion of Dallas through his Grow South initiative, improving public education, combating poverty and domestic violence, developing parks, elevating the city's international profile, and attracting artists, young professionals, families, and corporations to Dallas. From fiscal 2011 to 2018, the southern Dallas tax base grew by 60%. In 2016, Rawlings was selected as a Vital Voices Global Partnership honoree for his work to eradicate domestic violence. He was the 2017 recipient of the Joseph P. Riley Award for Leadership in Urban Design. And in 2018, he received the National Award for Local Arts Leadership from Americans for the Arts and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. In the years before his 20 elect 2011 election as mayor, he served as the chair of the Dallas Convention and Visitors Bureau the city's homeless czar and president of the Dallas Park Board. Early in his career, Rawlings worked his way up from an entry-level position at Tracy Locke to become CEO. Later, he took the helm of Pizza Hut and grew it to record sales. He previously served as chairman and managing partner of private equity firm CIC Partners, where he is currently the vice chairman. Mike will participate in a moderated conversation with Rob Kaplan, who is the current president and CEO of the Dallas Fed. Before joining the Fed, Rob was a professor and senior associate dean at Harvard Business School, which he joined after a long business career at Goldman Sachs. About 30 minutes into our event, we'll be taking audience questions. If you'd like to ask the speakers a live question, please click the uh, raise hand icon on the bottom of the control bar to enter the queue. If you'd prefer to submit a written question, use the Q&A button to submit your question to the queue. We will try to get to as many questions as possible and also try to address questions in the order in which they are received. And we apologize in advance if we do not get to your question. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Rob. Thank you, Mark and Mayor Rawlings. It's a, it's a real honor and a thrill for us to have you here tonight. We've spent a lot of time together over the last number of years, uh, but we're, we're thrilled to have you. You have, a, you have a lot of fans in this audience and I'll include two, which I'll call out today. Michael Kaplan and Alexander Kaplan, who you've met both, are both watching tonight. And they, they don't watch much, but they want to hear you speak. They're smart kids. Uh, not because of that, but I've, I've met them. I'm honored to be here. You've done a great job with these talks. I've been at many of them. I've heard many of them. And I like interviewing you. Uh, I, I don't like this thing about you interviewing me, but uh, we'll get through it. You're stuck with this tonight. So let's talk a little bit uh, about, because you have such an interesting story before you came mayor. You're, you're from Texas, but you went to college at Boston College, and then you came back here, and you went to work at a firm here, uh, Tracy Locke. What, 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 talk a little bit about how you got started in your business career. Well, first of all, you skipped over the most important thing for you and me, that we both went to the same junior high in uh, Overland Park, right. Kansas, if you That's remember right. that. <laughs> That's right. That's hard uh, so, to believe. It's so amazing. Born in Texas, kind of uh, early life in, uh, right outside of Kansas City, and then moved up northeast. And uh, I came back to Dallas uh, for a job. I was in uh, Boston in, uh, in uh, 76, and, and uh, you couldn't get a job then, as you remember. Uh, inflation was just going crazy, and the northeast was being hit hard. And uh, uh, came and visited my dad, who was in Fort Worth, and and got a job. And so, if you could fog up a mirror back then, you you got something, okay. And and I went to in the radio business and uh, uh, did that. And then uh, uh, somebody in college had told me I ought to get in the advertising business. I think they they thought I was a, a good BS -er or something, and 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 you know uh, that'd be a good thing. So I moved uh, into the advertising business and spent most of my career in marketing uh, for companies like Frito-Lay, uh, Tabasco, Mrs. Baird's Breads, uh, GTE, uh, other big uh, names, American Airlines, and really learned the business world through the service industry and how to sell products. And uh, 
started as an account executive and uh, uh, it was a great uh, company, great culture, make it happen. And I was able to rise up and take over the CEO realm uh, in, the, uh, in, in 1990. And what's the most important lesson you learned in, in that business? Well, when I was at Pizza Hut, I brought in Bobby Bowden uh, to speak to us because he had just won the national championship. And, and Bobby had the, the most bizarre advice, but it was so, it's so true. It was so true in the advertising business. He said, basically, all we do in, in this world is solve other people's problems. Okay. And if you solve other people's problems well, you're going to do great. And that was very true in the advertising business. Businesses had issues. They had to connect with customers. They had to cut budgets or they had to, they had to deal with competition. And uh, we were problem solvers. And, um, and you look at it that way and it helped me um, uh, be of value to, to, to clients. And if you're value to clients, then your value to your own shareholders. And that's what uh, uh, happened in my case. And did you particularly have a mentor or a coach that, that you learned from in those years that was good? Role I, I had a couple. Uh, my early boss, who was my boss twice, he uh, uh, created Yum, uh, David Novak, a uh, uh, CEO, and he became my boss when I ran Pizza Hut. Um, was kind of uh, a couple of years older than me, and he showed me the ropes. And then um, a, a guy by the name Bruce Crawford, who was the uh, um, a chairman of Omnicom, uh, took me under his wing a couple of times and gave me some uh, 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 good lessons. One was don't whine. Nobody likes a whiner, especially in the service industry, because you'd tell them how hard it was, and it was like, you know, stand in line. Uh, so, you know, had, had some folks, but I love Tracy Locke. It had Morris Height, and I got my taste a little bit for uh, the public sector because Morris back in the 50s and the 60s um, was, was right there with the big banks here in town that helped grow the business. And, and uh, he was uh, always giving back, and it was just part of the culture at, at Tracy Locke. And so then you went to CIC, you went into the private equity business. Uh, then I went to Pizza Hut. Excuse me, after Pizza Hut, I mean. Yeah, yeah. After I went, to, uh, after I was at Pizza Hut, um, I joined uh, a couple of great investors here in town, uh, Rusty Rose and Marshall Payne. And they had had an uh, investment firm uh, investing in different deals. And we create, and that was Cardinal Investment Company. And then in 2004, we created CIC partners so we could have something more sustainable and a little bit more uh, um, a concrete, if you will. And I've been with the CIC now uh, for those uh, uh, 17 years, and it's been a it's been a great time, a great run. We've got a very unique business niche, as you know. We go after kind of smaller companies, owner operators that need to kind of. Uh, we bring some large cap talent to some of those smaller cap companies and uh, it, we help them grow. They make more money, our LPs do well and uh, I've got some great partners. So during your business career, you stepped up. Excuse me, I'm gonna move the sun is. Yeah, just, the sun yeah. is in there. You stepped up and became a leader uh, for looking for solutions for homeless uh, for the city. You were the chairman of the Dallas Convention and Visitors Bureau, as Mark said earlier. What caused you to step up in your business career and get involved in those activities? I think two things. One, I was brought up, I was not brought up a business person. Um, uh, I was brought up, uh, both my grandfathers were preachers, my, my, my mother and my father were teachers, uh, and my whole relatives were kind of public service sort of things. So this thought about actually making money was not something that was part of my ethos as a young person. Question is, what do you do for others? And that had always stuck with me. And, and so when I left Pizza Hut and joined the CIC and had a little more time in my hand, people came and asked me to do this. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot. And I, and, and I started the, the sense of kind of stepping into the public sector. Um, I, I, the other thing is, I got a little mad um, at, at cocktail parties 
and at dinner parties when everybody was bitching and moaning about life, okay? And how bad everything was and how this and how that. And we all know it and we, we do it ourselves at times. And I, I said, well, you should step in and do something about it. You know, more and more people that have actually operated things should actually try to solve some of these problems. And so that opportunity kind of shared, um, uh, showed itself to me. And I had to call, call myself out and said, am I going to just complain or am I going to do something about homelessness in Dallas? Am I going to do something about these things? So then through all that, you decided to run for mayor. And in, in, in what, what possessed you to make that decision? Yeah, that was a hard decision. Giving back in these roles was um, kind of manageable, if you will. But suddenly, as mayor, you became a public figure. And, um, and the, the job of mayor is a very unique one in Dallas, too, um, and, uh, and, and has its own challenges. Um, but a, a few people had, had called and, and urged me to run at different times in my life. And, and really, I tell the story uh, yeah. because it's true and it, it's, it's kind of a, a good parable. I, I give books to my, um, my kids at Christmas, different things that I would like them to read. And one was back when, when my son was early in, in college, Marcus Aurelius's uh, meditations about, uh, you know, virtue and what it means to do the right things. He was the last philosopher king probably in history, you know. And um, um, so I got a call. I said, no, I'm not going to run. I got my golf game's too good and I'm enjoying CIC. And I hung up and I said, this is an opportunity to talk to my son. So I asked him, Gunnar, don't tell me what I should do, but ask, tell me what question I should ask myself. Because usually it's the questions you ask, not the answers that are most important. And he actually thought about this. And when kids think it, that scares you. And he, he looked at me and said, what would the virtuous man do? And I went, huh. oh, I'm dead. I'm dead. Wow. You know, he's called me out uh, about being a team player and not about myself. And this was a moment of truth for myself. And I, I, I jumped in. So, And so I'll ask you the question that always occurred to me. So when you jump in, you're going to have to compete. There are other people running. Do you worry about how to campaign? Do you hire, you go and find a campaign manager and yeah. how'd you go about, how do you go about I, it? I did. I, I had a lady that I had worked with on some different things and I, it, and that wasn't the hard part. Um, once I spent the money to do the research, I'm a marketer by trade, as you, right. as you know, so I, research customer base. I understand concepts. I understood myself as a concept. Nobody knew who I was necessarily, but they, I, we could articulate the concept. I knew the other candidates. I did the research and found that uh, I could win if I executed that, that plan. And fortunately, the community came and rallied around me and, and funded me well. And I was able to tell the story and, uh, and win. And so then you, you won the election. I think you've explained to me uh, a, a number of times the structure of being mayor, and I think you alluded to it a moment ago. What, what are some of the limitations and constraints on being mayor? Well, I, the mayor in Dallas is more like being the non-executive chairman of a public company, okay? Yeah. You, you, have, you are the face of it. You've got to you've got to uh, uh, espouse the strategies and the, uh, and and how it's performing, but you have other board members and you've got a CEO and the CEO in this case in a in a city manager form of government is the city manager. Right. So basically, you what you do is set up the agenda, you set up committees. You set up uh, your uh, uh, your your personal agenda for the city and what you want to accomplish over those times, and then work it. You've got a bully pulpit. People come running to you when there's a crisis and say, "You know, why don't you take care of this?" And my wife was constantly saying, "Why don't they know that you can't just pull a trigger and just 
change everything. And but it was a great leadership uh, uh, lesson, you know, because ultimately leadership is getting people to follow you when they don't have to follow you. Okay, and uh, so we we did that, and uh, Dallas had a great run in uh, um, in the 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 teens, I think we call it now. Right, and so. Let's just go through some of the, the, the big priorities as you assessed the, uh, the city and the, the DFW area. Uh, what, did you, what were your number, what were your top priorities, the things that you decided you needed, you wanted to make an impact? Well, first, I wanted to get the swagger back in, in Dallas. We had lost a little bit of that. Houston, if, if you kind of go back 20 years, it was, it was suddenly the rising uh, uh, star. Uh, I think uh, Bill White had done a wonderful job as mayor there, and um, and Dallas was kind of losing its its uh, its chutzpah. Uh, we had it there in the '80s and '70s, so I wanted to accomplish that. The second thing I wanted to do was make us a more inclusive city. Uh, Dallas has a has a uh, uh, a, a tradition of being a bifurcated city, the North and the South, the white and the minority community, uh, the rich and the poor. And that wasn't going to cut it for me. And, and so I wanted to make sure that uh, we had that. And the third thing I wanted to do was make it a, um, a city that was built on education. I'm a believer that the cities across the world are young cities where people come get educated, they stay, they raise their families. And so I wanted to focus on education, even though education is not in the purview uh, of the org chart, if you will, of the mayor. And lastly, I wanted to make it a global city. Uh, we have DFW, uh, which is uh, one of the most important airports in the world. And we didn't have enough non-stops, definitely to China, um, and and uh, South America, we had a few, but we needed to extend that. We needed to get into the Middle East. And so I uh, spent a lot of time uh, making us more of an international global city, which we've become. We're a very multicultural city now, and we're not as bifurcated as we are. We still have issues, okay, some serious issues on uh, social uh, um, equality, financial equality, and those sort of things. But uh, that's what I spent my day and night doing. So I know, I think the first time I ever walked into your office, first thing you did is showed me a map. Uh -huh. And I didn't really understand exactly why, but after you explained it, and maybe in hindsight, I understand better. And you showed me some of these challenged areas in the city. Talk a little bit about what you tried to do to address some of these, uh, I guess you would call blighted areas where you wanted to create more progress. Well, first of all, people, I showed you the map because people don't realize how big Dallas is. I mean, right. Dallas is not only uh, the uh, eighth or ninth largest city in the United States, its land mass is massive. Uh, Southern Dallas kind of take I-30 uh, to the east and I-30 um, um, I, uh, uh, to the west, cut it that way. Uh, Southern Dallas is bigger than the city of Atlanta, for instance. So it's this huge thing. So we have that fact. Second is the growth that always been in the north. And, and frankly, the city ends at 635. So guess who's getting the growth? Plano and Frisco and, and Collin County and, and the like. Um, and Southern Dallas was this beautiful place, okay? Rolling hills and forest and all the stuff. But it had been the, the area that nobody invested in. A lot of redlining, serious redlining serious racism that had taken place over the years. And we needed to kind of deal with that issue up front. It's a, it was a maturing issue to kind of force these folks together, the business community. Um, I created a, a, a home builders association just for Southern Dallas and say, what do we need to do to knock these hurdles down? Uh, and then the, the other reason it created uh, an avenue of growth for us. We needed a growth engine. Every business needs a growth engine and a card up their sleeve. And this was our special card. And it wasn't like just taking care of the poor. This, was, this wasn't this was just an act of, uh, of, uh, of doing God's work. This was doing what the city of Dallas needed to do emotionally 
but also financially as well. Um, and so we created Grow South and Grow South had beachheads in different parts of the community. And um, I spent probably 50% of my time uh, focused on Southern Dallas and the initiatives of what citizens needed and wanted uh, there. So the, um, the uh, what is called systemic racism is dealt with at the street level and at the, uh, the grocery store level and th those things that are necessary. So the, the, other, the other related to that, you made a big point, and we've done a lot of work on this at the Dallas Fed and talked about this together, is the incidence of child poverty in, well, in the city of Dallas. I'll tell you what I, I it is, it's very interesting because I work with homeless. I understood uh, the least of these, if you will. I understood poverty. I was, I was taken back and I was, I was humbled, like, how am I gonna solve in a city manager form of government, how am I gonna attack poverty, okay? What cards do I have? So I dealt with it kind of from a growth and infrastructure standpoint. I it was a business guy, so I was able to do that and I'd take issues on. Finally, I came to the realization that we're not gonna change this unless we change the pathway for young babies, okay? It's not where we need to be, but the great news, think about it. In only 20 years, a new generation grows up. If we started today, every baby that was born and created the right environment, in 20 years ago, in 20 years from now, it'd be a big change. Yeah. And so we created an organization called the Child Poverty Action Lab late in my administration. And it was bringing in all the leaders of all the organizations from school districts, to hospitals, to the county, uh, to job training and say, let's focus on our kids. One out of more than one out of four children that grow up in the city of Dallas live at the poverty level. That's terrible. And so like a business person, we didn't want to just flail around and talk about you know, just all these, uh, these, these words that everybody uses, but eat the elephant one piece at a time with a systemic tactics that can deal with this and say, we're gonna half the number of folks, those kids in the next 20 years, okay? And so we started at 105, last year it was 100,000 kids, okay? So we are making progress. I bet with COVID, you probably got the numbers. It's gone back up. So we're now back up because of what COVID yeah. has done. But we had plans focused on the family, focused on public safety, focused on basics, uh, uh, needs that they have provided, um, uh, child uh, nutrition. Um, and really, um, uh, the, the, the way we look at neighborhoods now, I think, is much more um, um, intelligent and data-driven. In fact, uh, um, um, Mayor Johnson is using some of that to help with his public safety initiatives. And I think that's very smart. So um, it's ultimately, you know, as opposed to just trying to deal with poverty, let's take the family unit. Not that doesn't mean you shouldn't deal with these other folks, but let's right. do something we can make a big difference and of course, the most important thing for me that's going to make changes is education. Right. Is that those kids, as you well know, get educated and get a college degree, the world changes uh, overnight for them. So, um, and, and I'm skipping around it because of the because of uh, time. Um, you dealt with a number of uh, different types of crises. Uh, one was uh, uh, maybe a burning crisis, which was the pension fund situation. Mm -hmm more of a financial crisis. Uh, but I, I remember vividly in 2016, the ambush of Dallas police officers, right. which became the focus of the nation. And in, in that time, you became a national figure. Uh, talk a little bit about the experience of going through that and how you dealt with that. Well, the pension fund, first of all, was the hardest thing I've ever done. Okay, so just from a pure effort 
and, and problem solving thing most difficult. The, the assassination of our five police officers, okay, um, was the most heart wrenching thing, okay? Because first of all, it was around the, the issue that no one likes to talk about, but we have to talk about, and that's race, okay? In fact, I don't even like the word race for another reason, but there is a huge discrep uh, discrepancy between white and blacks and, and the racial uh, animosity that's there is significant. So it was a Black Lives Matter protest, peacefully done, and our, pol and our police officers were acting wonderfully, okay? They were really helping folks out, a lot of pictures. It was a, it was a chamber of commerce for a protest that you would want and then one um, mentally uh, ill man decided that he was gonna kill white officers and, and it turned into this, uh, this nuclear fusion exercise that just went viral. And, uh, and the biggest heartbreak was going to each of those funerals for those officers and knowing they got shot in the back of the head or at point blank range and the difficulties that uh, that happened. There's a book that was written uh, called uh, a stand the uh, uh, standoff, and it's uh, really really well written. I'll tell you what I learned though is the goodness of this city and the goodness of people. People did not turn on each other. Okay, you'd think the police officers would turn and say, "My God, you know they their poise was unbelievable." the black community just wrapped their arms around the police officers, okay, in, in, this, in this time. And we really kind of came together in that moment that we sang the Battle Hymn of the Republic with everybody holding hands at, at, at the Symphony Hall. Uh, well, uh, on my deathbed, I'll still remember that because I said, this is what heaven should be like. And, and so, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this forward today. We've been through a very substantial crisis with COVID, um, seemingly out of the blue, but we've now been living with it for a year. Uh, we obviously had a crisis in the state uh, a, a week ago. We'll get through it. Uh, you and I were talking before this about some of the lessons you learn as a leader when you're going through situations like this. Uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of tension and uh, understandably frustration. What, what advice, I guess, would you give or would you learn as a leader in some, some, uh, some ways you deal with this kind of situation? Well, there's a lot of leadership um, strategies and you've taught leadership courses. So, you know, many of the things that you believe in are there. I think on these cases, though, there was, a, there was a new aha that I got from outside looking back in, that we expect our politicians to be operators, okay? And they're not. They're governors, okay? They do policy. But when we have to get shots in people's arms, UPS... <laughs> <laughs> and McDonald's is a lot better about that. Right. And we just don't have the system in place for that. You'd think we would have it for the power grids, but even then we, we didn't have policies in place to force the process and discipline and the double checking of all this stuff. And so we have to think about government, uh, government in that. Do we want somebody that's gonna make us feel good because they look good and they're saying the things that I kind of believe in, or do we want to make sure the fire truck shows up at the house when there's a house fire? That's what I want. And so I would like more operators. Okay. I'm talking to your vast folks, get off your couch guys. Okay. If you know how to operate and get into government and help us operate better. Okay. And so related to that, uh, you and I have talked a lot about capitalism, role of business, surveys about what people think of businesses, and they're kind of, we're both business people, they're kind of disappointing when we read those. What, what's the role of business in solving a lot of these very thorny problems? Well, look, we are an amazing country. 
and the enterprise and the, um, the growth that we have seen in this country over the last 50 years is amazing. And you can show all the, the stuff and go to Warren Buffett's uh, annual uh, um, uh, meeting and he'll kind of walk you through that. It's fabulous, okay? The issue has been the disparity between the haves and the have nots. That's the issue. And so we shouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We should be figuring out how do we take our system and make it work for everybody? Now, I will say that I, I learned that even the bottom 10% in the United States from an income standpoint are wealthier than two thirds of the rest of the people on the planet, okay? That's why so many people are trying to get in because even, even the poor you know, have a relative to a lot of these countries are in a pretty good situation. But that doesn't do anybody any good when they don't have food on the table, okay? And somebody else is uh, flying a private jet. That doesn't make people feel good. And that's the formula for uh, a social in unrest, for riots and ultimately revolutions. And uh, you, so we've got to, as capitalists, we, as free enterprise believers, We've got to put the mirror at ourselves and say, what does capitalism 2.0 look like, okay? How are we going to grow it? Not wait for the government to catch us, but how do we create a new system that brings everybody along in this, in this process? Because ultimately it's, it's that silver equity, not just civil equity, but silver equity that needs to be dealt with. We know we got some folks that got more money than they'll ever need, right? right. And, and so we go, well, they're gonna be good philanthropists, but we have to think about this systemically. And I'm not sure we're doing that right now. Yep. Okay, we're gonna come back to this after we take some audience questions. Okay. And let me, let's, let's turn to the audience and let's take some questions and I'll turn to my friend, Mark Wynn and let's take some questions. Great, thanks. So just a reminder, if you want to ask a live question, just click on the raise hand icon on the uh, bar at the bottom of your screen, uh, or you can also submit a written question. Um, we have uh, two questions in, in the queue already. The first is from uh, Manoj. So Manoj, um, if I can unmute you, sorry. I'm having a problem getting Manoj, there he is. You can go ahead and ask your question, Manoj. Thank you, Mark. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Yep. Perfect. Uh, so, Mike, thank you for sharing your journey, I think, coming from parents who were teachers to becoming a business person and then ultimately moving into public service. It's, it's very encouraging. I think I really like it. One thing you touched upon was the homelessness, and that's where I think you walked on. I'm just curious to know why there is high homelessness rate in US compared to some of the developing country, although the literacy rate there is probably lower than US. And US saying, you know, it has something to do with education, but I think there are some other factors. So would you like to share what you have learned through that experience? Yeah, I will. I, I can't do a great comparison towards some of the developing countries, okay? because I haven't studied homelessness in those comparatively, but I will tell you our issue in the United States, okay? Um, and it, it, it's, it's got two levels to it. First of all, um, the majority of homeless, okay? First of all, every homeless person's got a different story. Their souls are different, and, and I've been inspired by many of them. But a majority have some sort of mental disability. Okay, and we have not in our health system figured out how to provide mental health in an effective manner. Okay, and maybe around the world uh, they have done that. The second thing is really about um, uh, the answer to being a, a homelessness is a home, is a house, and we cannot build um, um, a sustainable. Uh, supportive housing fast enough in this country, but definitely not in Dallas. It's, it's got a big issue in affordable housing. 
And uh, a lot of it is uh, uh, economics, but a lot of it is kind of government regulations and how we make decisions, zoning issues, and, and where these things are going to be. And so what happens is there's not a place to live, okay? And they are mentally ill. They self-medicate, um, many of them. And so we uh, call upon the uh, philanthropic community to do that. Um, I do believe in many of the countries I've visited, the housing equation has been dealt with a little bit better than I think the United States uh, has. And so one of the big issues that has been on the, the lips of a lot of people in the United States, and you're going to hear more and more about this next decade, is, is housing, the availability of housing. California has got a huge issue on that. Any urban environment does, and um, hopefully that will uh, uh, deal with it a little bit. But the main thing is to look at them as people and, and figure out how we kind of uh, uh, deal with this issue as, uh, um, uh, through the process. Thank you. Thanks, Manoj. Uh, next up is Robert Abtahi. Apologies if I uh, got the pronunciation of your last name wrong. Robert? Oh, yeah, that's that's fine. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, Mayor, I was just wondering, what do you think we, we see ourselves as a global city uh, from the time since you left office till now? I know a lot has changed. We've got a global pandemic. We've got uh, all kinds of economic and... Uh, health issues going on, but how do you see that Dallas on the global stage from your time in office till today? Thanks. Well, I, I really can't, um, um, I don't have enough data points in that short a period of time. Being on the global stage uh, doesn't, you can't, the inflection points aren't going to be year to year. I think they're going to be decade to decade. And what I realized is um, that um, uh, we were, besides the TV show Dallas, okay, we didn't have saliency around the world for decision makers the way we wanted to. And I saw a report that we were not, we were just barely in the top 50 on top of mind awareness of, of cities across the world. And it, and it got much higher and we did research to show it, it, it did. Uh, but uh, we've just got to keep the pedal to the metal. I mean, Look, we got to, it's, it's tough. You got to take care of the local issues and you got to be able to compete with the world country, uh, the world cities at the same time. Um, we're, we're competing against um, uh, Tokyo and London and uh, Sydney and uh, Seattle and, and uh, yes, Plano, but we got to do both. And um, that will drive the long-term growth. We're going to take over Chicago land. I don't know if you talk about this at your Fed meetings, but you know the Dallas-Fort Worth area is going to take over uh, uh, third place over Chicago land by the end of this decade, I believe. All right, and we can't do that without um, an international event. So. Um, all hands on deck to, to do it. And it just, I, I've met so many in the private equity side, I've met so many people from Pakistan, from, um, from, uh, that are Persian, that are uh, Israeli, that are from Africa, uh, that have come here and made a ton of money. And uh, it's exciting to see that take place. Thanks, Robert. Uh, next up is Paul Malouf. Paul, go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Uh, I'm in Dallas. I'm a Dallas resident, and thank you both for having this. I was wondering what kind of a relationship does Dallas have with the Federal Reserve? I, I know the Federal Reserve actually made Dallas a center, an economic center. And I was wondering if there was any department within the city that works with the Federal Reserve to help it in doing things. Well, we have an economic development um, uh, a department, and it relies, I know from the city standpoint, and then Rob can talk about it, it relies on a lot of the data that the Fed provides. Uh, so I think that's, that's important. The Fed's cuts are a little broad at times for the city itself, and, but yet uh, I think they're leading indicators. And I think the other thing that it does is the fact that it's right there in Clyde Warren Park, and that's the Fed and the events that take place at the Fed 
it's a it's a corporate citizen as far as I was am concerned, like AT and T and other other places. And that to me is a big difference when somebody comes in from out of town, a big business. We, as as everybody knows, we we got way down the road with Amazon, and to have the Fed office in Dallas it shows that, uh, that we're doing something right. So, so I guess Paul, you, you have to go back a hundred years, literally, when uh, the Federal Reserve decided where to locate each of its uh, main branches, and there was probably a lot of lobbying that went on at the time. <laughs> But, but our philosophy today, uh, as the mayor indicated, we want to be at the Dallas Fed. This is through the entire state and our district, which includes New Mexico and Louisiana. We want to be a leading citizen in our community. So I think a lot of our work, we deal with, may, we are very close to mayors, chambers of commerce, civic leaders, business leaders, all throughout this district. And we feel the onus is on us to be a leader, be a leading citizen, be a convener on a lot of the pressing issues the mayor's talked about. And, and I think we take that responsibility very seriously. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this. Uh, and my daughter is watching this as well from Edinburgh, Scotland. Oh, wow. <laughs> great, great city. That's a great city. We compete against Edinburgh. <laughs> well, thank you very much, both gentlemen. Thanks, Paul. Uh, is the next question from your daughter, Mia Malouf. Mia, go ahead and ask your question. Hello, so I, my name is Mia Malouf and I'm a sophomore at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, Mr. Rawlings, you talked about regarding um, making Dallas a more global city. And I just wanted to know how difficult was it when you were mayor for your team to think globally in order to better the community? Uh, it was a challenge. There was no question about it because uh, nobody gets kudos for, for going and, and thinking globally. I mean, uh, the kudos are to pick up the trash right, keep the uh, crime rate down. Those are the things that citizens care about. Um, fortunately, um, Dallas uh, owns 60% of DFW Airport with Fort Worth owning the other 40%. And it was important for um, Mayor Price in Fort Worth uh, and many of the businesses, both our chambers and uh, many of the businesses that we uh, contract, the amount of business Texas Instruments does in China is, is significant. The amount of Korean businesses that are, that are here are huge. The Japanese business, getting Toyota in North America and Plano uh, is a, was a big thing because a lot of suppliers came from California, out of California here to, to support them. And so um, there were enough people that had drank the Kool-Aid that I could get them on that, that bandwagon. And we were able to get stories in, 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 on TV and in places that people had, that, once again, all they knew about Dallas was JR. And, uh, and now suddenly we're this arts community where this the largest tech uh, employer in this in the state uh, you know things like that that people didn't know and um, uh, it's it, it started to change it but it's one of the leadership issues that Rob talks about you have to have a vision and then kind of get the people that buy off and then suddenly there's a parade behind you and people start to get it other people don't care about it that's a different in policy but uh, I do and Mayor, just to give a window on your on how you spent your time as mayor, how much time would you spend? I know you took overseas trips. Yeah, in a typical I, I year. Probably, I probably spent all in three or four weeks, three weeks a year, because I did a lot of receiving diplomats here. Right. Um, I was always, I'm, I'm still a little bit upset that a lot of the consulates are in Houston and not in Dallas, so. I was always competing against uh, that, uh, getting new business um, uh, from international people that, that, that brought that. So everybody knew that was on the top of priority list and, and I spent that, but uh, it was well spent. And uh, since I did have a good partner in Betsy um, and at DFW, Sean Donahue does a hell of a job out there. And uh, we were able to, we, we won airline, airport of the world, in the world, the best airport in the world one year. 
you know, uh, uh, and, and that wouldn't have happened, I don't think, if you if hadn't leaned into it. That's incredible, especially getting in um, Toyota from Japan and then having all the cultural differences that you successfully um, came into Dallas. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, I don't say you. It was definitely a team and a lot of other people did a lot more than I did. Probably. Go ahead, Mark. Great question. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, is more in the way of a comment or question. Please ask this from Raymond Termini. Uh, please ask him if he's read Thomas Ricks's bestseller, First Principles and his definition of virtue. What do you think of it? Uh, I think he must have read it because he's lived up to it. Civil service with a desire to serve the public. So I question, know, comment. I know Thomas Ricks and I have not read that book, uh, but I know him, him speaking of it. And uh, um, Look, I'm an old school guy. Virtue is very important to me. And uh, I define it really as, as I think the most important decision we can make is how we deal with the other, right? We have, we have power to, to, to make decisions about us, to feed ourselves, to house ourselves. But the question is, how do we deal with the other person, whether they're a neighbor, whether they're a family member, whether they're somebody that we um, don't see eye to eye, whether another state, another country, another city. And, and, and virtue comes from that because um, um, the, the great uh, a, a Jewish theologian, Martin Buber, said, you got to treat them like God. It's an I thou relationship. And, and suddenly you feel more like you feel more holy because of that. And that's where virtue comes. And I think um, uh, Rick's is uh, uh, a challenge to us is good. Uh, next question in the queue from an audience member. How did the cities of Highland Park and University Park affect Dallas, both positive and negative, uh, a hole in the middle of the city? Well, I, I, I don't think it's been long enough now that I can probably tell this story, but uh, while I was running, I met President Bush. He was just out of office, okay? And uh, just wanted to, I knew him and just wanted to tell him that I was running and didn't ask for his endorsement or anything. I just was being, he was a city, he was a resident. And he brought up that same question right there. He said, what are you gonna do about Highland Park and University Park? Because uh, Houston has River Oaks. Um, and it's part of the city of Houston. It's not a separate, you know, bubble in the city. Now, I tried to turn lemon uh, into lemonade, and I told um, um, both of those uh, cities that I thought it was in my, they were my top, in my top 10 assets for the city of Dallas. Why? One, they, uh, a tremendous amount of business and philanthropy came from those residents, okay? So they felt like they were in Dallas and I wanted to applaud that, okay? Second, because of education. SMU uh, uh, feels like they're in Dallas and I, I wanted to accept them. Um, um, uh, the President uh, Turner and Mayor Johnson created that little logo that they wear now and I think it's fabulous that, that we're a Dallas place. And there's so many great things that have come in those cities. Would I like it to be part of the city of Dallas? Yes, but that decision was long uh, left the, the, the train. And the question is, how do, we, how do we use it? It's very funny though, when I get calls from, and people would stop me um, uh, that, that live in Highland Park and complained about the, uh, the noise at Love Field because it was flying over their Highland Park house. And I said, now to talk to the Highland Park mayor. I'm not your mayor. Very good. Um, next uh, question from Christy Netterman. Uh, what are your thoughts on the 14-1 decision the fifth, and the fiefdom argument on whether another structure would work better for Dallas? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really existential issue <clears throat> that I think the, the city uh, and, and, and the citizens need to grapple through. I supported 14-1 when I uh, ran for mayor. And you should I, probably explain a little bit more background what that is. Thank you. And I stayed supporting. Let me explain what it is. 
one of the real issues of um, uh, racial um, uh, example of systemic racism was that we had um, uh, four, I think, at large seats, okay, that people elected, not only the mayor, but other council people. So everybody voted and voted for at large seats. What happened is you had, a, you had all those people from North Dallas because people in North Dallas voted, the voter base was higher. And so you never got the representation until there were lawsuits and it was taken to a federal judge and, the, and they knocked um, our old system down and created a system where there were 14 districts uh, out there and I think 85,000 uh, uh, citizens per district and divided up like congressional districts um, and then the mayor. Um, and I think it's been great because we've finally gotten ownership, people feel involved and people um, are um, understand that they've got a man uh, downtown to quote uh, Commissioner's Price's uh, 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 slogan, you know, that there's somebody at the city council fighting for them. The issue is in two places. One is you do create fiefdoms as, as was said, okay? And everybody's got to fight for what their constituents need to get, or they're not going to get reelected. If they're not getting their fair share, if Lake Highlands doesn't get their fair share and South Oak Cliff gets more, okay, which has happened a lot, okay, believe it or not, even though it's, we've underinvested uh, for decades in Southern Dallas, in recent years, we've it's switched. People get upset and say, wait a minute, why don't I get my fair share? The second issue has to do with really the strategic leadership for the city. And now you've got a city manager, okay, form of government that has 15 bosses. And you, you can imagine the type of input the best city manager that wants to make peace can get. It can be very confused. So when I did Grow South that we talked about, Rob, okay, I had to take that offline and just say, this is gonna be my private initiative. And, and the city came along to a certain extent. I got co-opted some council people. They helped me with different things, but it wasn't, we didn't take a vote around city council. Do we like Mayor Rawlings Grow South initiative? I just said, let's go do that. Raise private capital to make investments and put these initiatives together. And so it's a clumsier form of government uh, right now and there's not as much accountability as some people would like, and that's the argument against it. But I, I think in the world that we're trying to make sure that we have everybody around the table, okay, of all backgrounds, that we have that. We can be proud of that in the city of Dallas. Uh, next question uh, is from Diane Lowe. Uh, you alluded to the gap in wealth and the need to deal with that, the haves and the have-nots. Are you in favor of changing our tax system to increase taxes on the super wealthy? What other levers would you support to better distribute wealth to improve our society? Well, I'm not running for anything, but so I guess I can say, say this. I, I'm supportive of uh, the structures that President Biden is talking about now. I. I don't believe the answer ultimately is wealth transfer, okay? You take all those wealthiest people and you took all their money away, it would be a drop in the ocean of what we need uh, to sustain long-term systemic um, uh, growth for uh, economically for those people. But we've, I mean, uh, look, when, when uh, an assistant pays more taxes than somebody that's that's super wealthy, there's something out of whack. So I, I believe there needs to be some change there. Uh, but I'm not a, um, I'm, I'm a fiscal conservative. I like to make sure we kind of live within our means and I just don't like going spreading around things. What I do care about is how we spend money in this country uh, about different programs, mental health, education, 
the, the, we, I was so proud of the United States that we sent this little golf cart or whatever it is, the, the planet Mars. Think about that, Rob, when we were kids, go to Mars, okay? And you think we could educate our children where they really understand math and science and their, and their reading level, their, at, at third grade reading level. That's where we need to invest money. And to me, that's different than, than wealth redistribution. And that's why we got to think about free enterprise and what does that mean? Is there, a, is there a, are, are there trust funds that are set up for, for education and job training and research and development and those things? So let me ask you a little bit about that. One thing I noticed as a business person, you know, I, I know I'm going to be at the business for the next 10, 20 years, and I'm willing to make long-term investments and be patient and let them, it strikes me, education is a great example. It, it's not a one or two year or three year, it's a relentless every year and early childhood, yeah. you know, secondary skills training. What, what do we need to do to create a more of a long-term mindset in some of these governmental initiatives so they think that way? You know Jim Collins' uh, analogy about the hedgehog. That, that the hedgehog is the one that makes the progress because they do a little bit all the time forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay? Right. We don't do that in the United States. We're a microwave society. We don't like this politician. We throw him out and we do this. And it's a different, um, it's a, it's a different way to to look at it. And so uh, I'm uh, concerned that we um, don't have clear goals for ourselves that we can all get around. Surely everybody can get around the goal of all kids being on the reading gr uh, level at third grade. And we yeah. all should be measured against that no matter what party you're on. Okay. Yeah and accomplish those uh, uh, sort of things that I, 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 I think are, are, are critical. And the question is, how do we use capital? You know, I'm, there was this debate, do people do it by themselves? They get their bootstraps and, they, they, and, and, and I love enterprise and people doing it, but we also know we're all living in a community. And yeah. so how do, you, how do you give back without creating a nanny state and, and just, just funding programs. One thing that government doesn't do, Rob, is reinvent itself all the time. Right. Businesses have to, or they yep. go bankrupt. So, they, so the one interesting thing that strikes me in talking to you, and I've thought about this, you spent decades in business. You learned a lot. Probably your last years, right before you became the mayor, you were extremely effective because you had so much experience. You were mayor then for all those years. And it's kind of a shame observing that you're not, you know, can you take that? That, that experience is invaluable. Uh, I guess I'll ask you, do you for starters, do you, and I've had this conversation, do you miss public service? And uh, what would you say about it? Yeah, no, I, I don't miss being mayor of Dallas. It was, <laughs> it was a, a wonderful honor and uh, it was a, uh, uh, great growth experience but given the 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 system that we've got in Dallas it was it was enough okay and I'm going to speak out the other side of my mouth and say I also believe in term limits now okay and we talk about things that aren't sustainable but I do think fresh uh, blood needs to come in uh, to the system I just wish that from a policy standpoint, we could agree on our objectives, okay? What our objectives are. And I wish we'd get away from, from just incendiary uh, phraseology that are political hot buttons on the left and the right, okay? Right. And talk about systemic change and plans. I mean, that's why China is gonna, be, is, is really gonna be a competitive issue because they're the hedgehogs, okay? Yeah. And they've got a 20 year plan on these things. And we, we've got like, what's going to happen to the Dow next quarter. Okay. Right. You know, the fed screwed it up or something. We blame right. everybody. We don't have thoughtful plans. I'm going to ask you two quick questions first, because it's an interesting subject, the press. 
Mm -hmm. as mayor, and I deal with this also, but you dealt with the local press, the national press. Um, what's the role? It's been a lot of debate about this the last few years. What's the role of the press? And do you worry many of the local newspapers are struggling, you know, making the business model work? We're losing some of that capacity. What's your comment on, uh, on the role of the press and how important it is? Well, it's very important. My dad was a journalist. He taught at TCU. He taught journalism and he spent a lot of time. We talked about this as a young as a young person. So to me, the fourth estate is hugely important in a free uh, world. And so I think we need to be free. OK, I, I do believe uh, I do believe that the role of the press is to inform the public, OK, to make the public smarter. Um, and uh, it's sad because business wise, it's not a profitable industry right. to inform the public because what you have to do is you have to hire more people, more experienced people digging deeper into the issues. And all we care about are these things and the tweeted headlines on, on things. And so I'm worried about that. From a press standpoint, I'm concerned about the celebrity nature of press. And I'm not trying to bemoan that, that, that journalists make their money too, okay? But, but it's not, I care less about your opinion and more about the work that you did and provide me insights about what's happening in the world. Am I learning as a citizen? That's what I look at and that's the type of uh, media that I spend around? Am I better informed because I spend time with you? Sadly, I think a lot of people just want to hire dopamine rush because they they see a, a picture or they see a headline that, you know, uh, racial strife in America, okay? You know, and, and okay, my, I'm supposed to be nervous and, and deal with something, but it's like, let's really understand that and what that all means. Right. All right, so let me ask you a question in, in closing. Um, uh, you've been in the private sector, you've been in the public sector, you're, you're very active in the community, you've been very active in elements of what, what we're doing nationally. We've got a, a big group listening tonight, many community business leaders, nonprofit leaders uh, who want to make a difference in the world. What advice would you give them on things, actions they could take, things they could do to help make this a better community, a better state, and a better country? Well, the most of the time, we have been trained that if your business wants to give back, you uh, go to my church's uh, um, uh, homeless center, the stew pot, and help serve food or hand out clothes. And I think that's very important to do. When you're from a business leadership standpoint, we need something more than that. We need you to use your skill, might be an accountant, a balance sheet, you know, to understand balance sheets and nonprofits. It might be a, a real estate person to sort out how to take care of the homeless with, with that. And I start to see more of that. So the first thing I would do is ask people to look at what your skill is and find a place that matches that, not just um, uh, um, do other stuff. Now, I, 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 I think that's how we get it. And then the second thing is to, I know it's terrible, this political world that we live in, but just have the courage to stick your 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 foot in okay because we need thinkers we need operators we need people that can make a difference and whether it's and i'm really a big fan of the school board position uh mm. i i in some ways i feel the school board is more important to the city of dallas than the city council because it's creating the future the city of dallas by those kids and there are a lot of positions uh uh, people have volunteered and I put them as chairs of commissions and, and committees and, and give that time back. And people will come back and say, oh, my God, that was crazy. But they are better for it and the city's better for it. And so have the courage to kind of uh, uh, raise your hand and, 
and ask questions and, and don't take the easy way out just by the sound bites that happen on TV. Mayor Rawlings, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for all you've done to contribute to this city and, and to the country. And I'm sure you're going to do a lot more in the future. And it's a real honor to have you here tonight. Well, you're great. And what the feds meant to Dallas has been uh, immeasurable. So thank you. Okay, thank you all for joining us this evening. Apologies if you submitted a question that we did not get to. Uh, you'll soon receive a survey asking for feedback on this event, and we would very much welcome your candid responses. We hope you'll be able to join us for some of our upcoming Global Perspectives events in the coming months, which will feature Council on Foreign Relations President Richard Haas, Dallas Maverick CEO Cynthia Marshall, Presidential Historian Michael Beschloss, uh, Fort Worth Mayor Betsy Price, and many more. Details on how to register can be found at dallasfed.org. And with that, we are joined.